If you were trapped in a spaceship for 86 years, what would you do? There's an alien threat lurking around the corner, and people are beginning to go crazy. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the alien threat in Voyagers. <laughs> This space mission is about to go terribly wrong. In the near future, Earth is becoming uninhabitable, and humans are beginning to look for new planets to colonize. With no other option, scientists find a new planet. However, the voyage to get there will take 86 years. This woman explains they'll send children on board, with those children's grandchildren being the ones to successfully finish the trip. This man, Richard, explains that they need to find 30 willing volunteers to make the mission work as planned. However, no one wants to take part. He proposes that they breed their own crew with the sole purpose of completing the mission. That way, the crew members won't have any memories of Earth. The only bad thing is that they'll be all alone, and 30 children may not have enough experience to make it through the full voyage. Monitoring the kids in a spaceship simulator, Richard makes sure the children are comfortable and helps them with simple logic puzzles. The next day, he tells a subordinate that he wants to go with them. However, for Richard, it's a one-way trip. She tells him that they're training them in a closed-off environment so they won't miss the luxuries of Earth on the voyage. He tells her that he doesn't care, and says that the crew will be able to leave in four years instead of seven if he comes along. Richard and the crew are sent off to space, with the final closing of the hatch meaning it'll be the last time he ever sees Earth. Ten years later, the children have grown into young adults. They're lectured on the goal of the mission, with their only purpose being to stay healthy and breed two more generations of children to reach the new planet. Living out their daily lives, they finish their activities by taking a shot of blue liquid. In the captain's room, this girl Sela here is hanging out with Richard and expresses her disappointment with being the first generation on the ship. No one from her generation will ever know what the planet is going to look like since they'll die long before the trip is finished. Richard tries cheering her up by showing her a picture of his father and grandparents. Okay, this is a horrible idea to begin with. These people are raising babies to go up into a spaceship to procreate and die. These space voyagers are literal children, and the whole operation relies on them being able to exist in harmony, while the fate of humanity waits for their grandchildren to arrive on this new habitable planet. They have no idea who these children will grow up to be, and are relying on this one man to raise them all. There needs to be more adult supervision on board, and if it were me, I would send a crew of adult professionals rather than raising these children to die. It takes about 11 years to become an astronaut, and these children aren't even 11 years old yet. Even though it's a good idea to raise someone from an early age to grow accustomed to this sort of environment, the main problem is that in those 11 years that are required to become an astronaut, there are psychological evaluations that take place to make sure the person is fit for the mission. These children aren't even fully formed yet, and nobody knows who they will grow up to be and what their personalities will be like. In a worst case scenario, they could even be claustrophobic, and even then, them being up in space would be literal torture for them. This mission is also taking the element of free will out of the equation. In our world, people are dying to travel to outer space, and in Voyager's world, Earth is becoming uninhabitable, so it would create even more motivation for astronauts to want to volunteer. Staying on Earth means that they will die eventually, so why not at least spend those years furthering the species? If the problem is that these people will die too soon, why not have couples that are already together travel in space? That way, they will have company and will be able to raise their children together. This will allow the children to grow up with emotional attachments to the people other than Richard, who can then be a moral and scientific guide for them. Richard here is being trusted to go up into space with the children, and they are assuming that he won't go crazy, and it doesn't make any sense that they wouldn't put other astronauts on board to help complete the mission. The next day, Richard is monitoring the kids repairing the ship. However, this boy Chris here gets a message that there's toxins in the irrigation water, and realizes that there's something in the crew member's urine causing the disturbance. Asking Richard if they're eating something toxic, he's quick to change the subject, and tells Chris to change the filter. He decides to show his curly hair friend Zack the mysterious chemical called T-56J. They're confused why the information on it is unavailable if it's in something they eat. That night, the boys manage to hack into one of the computers and get past the firewall blocking the information. They manage to find the document on the chemical and find some disturbing news. Reading the description, they find out that the chemical is a potent anti-androgen meant to reduce a person's libido and make them dull and docile. The document adds that combining it with blue alkaline syrup will combat stomach irritation. That's when they realize the chemicals in the blue shots of water. The next Next day, they decide to throw away the blue shots for the first time in their entire lives. They tell two other crew members that they've done so, and this tall kid here asks if anything feels different. Zack uses a wire to shock everyone, and that's when another crew member walks in to tell them they're wasting electricity. In the captain's office, Chris asks Richard why he's been lying to the crew members. He tells him that there's an unmarked compartment in pod 23, but Richard says they need to keep some
some secrets for the sake of the mission. He says that he doesn't know what's inside either, claiming it must be for the third generation. Later on, Richard sends a report back to Earth asking for their permission to tell the kids about what's really going on. However, the message will take over two months to arrive. In the cafeteria, Chris begins to develop a rush of romantic feelings for Stella, but holds himself back. After they finish eating, Zack approaches her and says that she looks completely different. Confused, she walks away. While exercising, Zack and Chris begin play fighting, but get way too into it. This scares the other crew members, wondering what's happened to them. They run around and play in the hallways, where they notice a strange noise. They go into the surveillance room and meet another boy, who tells them he has no idea what the source of the noise is. They suspect there might be an alien life form outside, but the reality is much more terrifying. Okay, these kids have been medicated all of their lives not to feel anything, and now, for the first time, they're feeling the rush of emotions that have been suppressed all of these years. Now, these boys have felt the rush of adrenaline and sexual desire for the first time, and there's no going back. Richard could try to medicate them again, but he would have to physically restrain them over and over to keep forcing them to take the blue medication. This is a small ship, and even if he could get away with medicating them against their will, eventually others would start asking questions, and all hell would break loose once the others know that they've been medicated too. There's also two of the boys and one of Richard, so he could be easily overpowered if he doesn't restrain each of them fast enough. In order to try to keep these boys from telling the others about the medication, Richard has to send Chris and Zack back down to Earth. Unfortunately, the people in charge of this mission have far too much at stake, and have already kept all these kids in a state of sedation all of their lives, so they have to continue with this plan. They could try to reason with the kids, and tell them it was always a part of the plan to slowly wean them off of the medication as they got older, but there's only one of Richard, and so many of the kids, and there's no telling how they will take it. To not risk all-out havoc breaking loose on a mission that has to work for the sake of humanity, Richard has to isolate the problem and get rid of Chris and Zack as soon as possible. In most science fiction, there are vessels like escape pods to help humans flee failing ships or alien attacks. Similarly, in reality, space stations like the International Space Station use Soyuz capsules, which are ships used to transport cosmonauts to and from Earth. Richard and the kids are about 10 years away from Earth, which means that the ships would have to be more advanced to withstand this length of a trip. But the technology Technology in this world is much more advanced than ours, and they would have to have prepared a backup plan in case the larger ship malfunctions. If they were me, in their sleep, I would sedate the boys with the blue liquid, making them docile and easier to control. I would even give them more than the average dosage in the hope that this would knock them unconscious, and then place them in a pod back to Earth. I would then have to explain to the rest of the kids that Chris and Zack were sick and needed to be sent back to Earth for everyone else's safety. Outside, the boys spot Richard and Stella having a private conversation. Zack gets annoyed seeing the captain put his hand on her. And and wonders why he couldn't touch her back in the cafeteria. Richard gathers everyone in the meeting room and tells them they've lost contact with Earth. A malfunction has occurred in the ship, and Richard here will have to go outside to fix it. He tells Zack to accompany him outside and gets the rest to continue what they're doing. While getting ready for the repairs, Zack notices Sela near the exit gates. Suddenly, he begins touching her inappropriately, which causes Richard to separate them. He questions the boy about what he's done, but Zack quickly runs away. Richard goes to look for him and meets Phoebe here in the hallway. She tells him that she doesn't know where Zack is, but spills the beans on him that he stopped taking Taking the blue shots. Walking further, he finds Chris and asks him if he already knows about Zack. Chris tells him that he's not taking it either and accuses the captain of drugging them. He admits that they're using something to stop the crew members from making impulsive decisions like what just happened earlier. They're interrupted by Phoebe, so Richard here decides to go along with the repairs with Chris. Still annoyed, Zack sits in the systems room with the curly haired crewmate while they get ready to send the repairmen off. Outside the ship, repairs are going smoothly. That's when they hear something strange. Suddenly, a dark shadow appears on the outside, and the ship begins to lose power. Richard here is sent flying off the ship due to the interference. Chris manages to bring him back inside and into the operating table, but it's too late. The kids pronounce him dead on the spot, and this crewmate insists that this wasn't an accident. There was an alien life form that hit him off the ship. However, Chris doesn't believe everything adds up. They try looking through the footage to get a better idea of what the alien looks like, but all the footage has been destroyed. Either way, now that Richard is gone, the kids must pick a new captain. Zack here volunteers to be their leader, but they decide to have an election instead. After the votes are counted, the new captain is appointed as Christopher. His first order of business is to repair the ship and restore communication with Earth. The kids continue to repair the ship, but meanwhile, Sela takes a look through Richard's room. She finds photos and videos of his family, and that's when someone knocks on the door. It's Chris. So Sela invites him inside to show him his photos. However, he's not interested in Richard and confronts her about the touching incident. She says that nothing happened between them, explaining that Richard would bring her in and show her about his life because he felt lonely.
Okay, Richard is dead, and now everybody knows that there's medication in the blue liquid. Chris has been appointed captain, and there are already early signs that Zack is going to act more and more erratically. Chris has made it his mission to try to reach out and communicate with ground control, but since those in charge of the mission have lied to all of these kids for all of their lives, this isn't going to win him any brownie points with the people who have just appointed him captain. Chris needs to first win over everyone's favor by trying to get to the bottom of Richard's death and find out the origin of the alien. The problem is that Richard is no longer around, which means these kids can do whatever they want, and now Chris is their only authority figure. The difference between Chris and Richard is that Chris is one of them and doesn't have much authority over his fellow voyagers. If he tries to boss them around with tasks that they don't want to do, they will eventually overthrow him unless he gets on their side and is able to complete a mission that went over their favor early and fast. The alien is the biggest threat to Chris and the fellow voyagers because not only has it just killed Richard, but even if the voyagers are able to get back in contact with ground control, there's no way for anyone on Earth to help them in the case of there is actually an alien. If I were Chris, I would ask Sella to study Richard's body more carefully to figure out the exact source of his death. Based on the markings on his skin, it looks like he was electrocuted, but if there was actually an alien involved, it may have left a trace of its origin on his skin. If Sel is able to find anything that points to what type of alien it is, this can help the rest of the Voyagers feel more safeguarded against it. If Sella finds that Richard was simply electrocuted while working on the ship, this gets rid of the fear of an alien altogether. Chris's other main problem right now is Zack, who has been harassing Sella and is clearly power hungry. While Chris tries to get to the bottom of the alien, he can start to have the Voyagers cast votes for rules and regulations on the ship that will later keep Zack from acting out. Those that don't follow the rules will then have to be sedated with the blue liquid. Then once Chris has clearly been established as the new leader and has won over the general public, he can take away Zack's position, and if he acts out, he will have to suffer the consequences that the majority has already decided on. Later on, Chris realizes everyone is slacking off and tells them to get back to the repairs. Zack tells him there's an issue with the refrigerators, and the crew is helping him fix it before they lose any food. However, some of the food needs to be eaten now. So Zack here proposes they host a party to celebrate Chris's new position. After eating, Chris tells everyone to stop drinking the blue, but he doesn't realize that this is going to end up in the death of someone here. Zack and another crew member start to get intimate during work. Afterwards, he takes them to Richard's room to watch videos, but Sella here walks in and is furious, demanding everyone leave. Zack confronts her, saying that Richard wasn't the man she thought he was. Chris sees them talking and decides to follow Sella to make sure she's alright. He sees Zack approaching and pretends to make out with Sella. His friend leaves in anger. However, Sella here doesn't take it the right way and tells him to leave as well. In the hallway, the boys meet up and Chris here tells Zack to leave her alone. Suddenly, they're interrupted by some strange noises. Meanwhile, this tall kid sees two of the crew members kissing each other and gets jealous, rushing in to attack the other boy. Zack manages to break him up in time and the crew return to the cafeteria. However, it's not over yet. Loverboy comes back for revenge, attacking the tall boy with a wrench. They hold him back and Chris here punches Loverboy in the face. He holds a meeting telling the crew they need to stop fighting and continue working on the ship. The leader proposes they continue with repairs, but Zack here doesn't agree. He says they should be working on food so that they're strong enough to fight the alien that Chris brought into the ship. He tells everyone that he'll be starting his own group and anyone who wants to join is welcome. Half of the kids end up leaving, but Sella and the others decide to stay with Chris. Chris's group goes to check out the security footage archives while Zack's group investigates the room where the alien is hiding. He and the tall kid walk into the systems room when suddenly they hear a strange noise and rush outside. Okay, Zack here needs to be killed. He's becoming a threat to Chris's leadership, and he's influencing the others to resort to violence and give in to their impulses regardless of the outcome. At this point, I would have to abandon my attempts to fix communication with Earth and spend the majority of my time trying to debunk everything that Zack says to gain back control over the majority of the ship's voyagers. Food is an essential resource to the passengers on the spaceship, and without it, everyone will die. The refrigerators containing the food breaking right after Richard's death, and Chris's win over Zack in the election is convenient and if I could get to the bottom of how exactly they broke, then I would be able to uncover that Zack is in fact the main threat to the mission's success. Everyone right now is aligning with Zack out of mistrust and fear. Nobody wants to trust the higher-ups at ground control because they have been drugging them all of their lives, and the Voyagers are completely on their own now. They need a strong leader that will be resourceful and will reinforce a sense of safety and security over certain aspects of everyday life, like the food. Zack is the head of engineering, but that doesn't mean that he's the only engineer, so by having one of the other engineers 
secure the food supply quickly, then it takes away a lot of Zack's power. Knowing how the food supply came under fire as well will help give Zack less power over the Voyagers. The other problem that all the Voyagers are dealing with is the fact that they are experiencing sexual desire for the first time. People are fighting over who's sleeping with who, and there needs to be rules in place against violence on the ship. If it were me, I would look through Richard's archives to find any information how violence has led to the demise of societies to show that killing one another over romantic partners is a surefire way for everyone to die before we are able to reproduce and reach the new planet. There aren't many people on the ship, and if enough of us are killed, then we won't be able to live for much longer anyway. By reminding everyone that living in harmony is essential to our survival, then I may be able to tap into everyone's sense of reason. Romantic desire is a strong impulse that is difficult to reason with, but the threat of death is even stronger and will present a new fear that will keep everyone in line. Meanwhile, Chris's group manages to restore the surveillance footage. However, it's still too blurry and hard to hear. That's when other members of the group run in to tell Chris what just happened. They say that Zack fought the alien in the systems room and it destroyed everything inside, including all the surveillance units. However, Chris tells him that he saw nothing when he was there. Sela interrupts, saying that if there's no alien, then there must be another reason for making up a false story. Chris decides to play the footage over, finding a recording from when he and Richard went outside to fix the ship. Suddenly, they catch the two boys intentionally plotting to electrocute Richard. The entire thing was a lie. There is no alien, and the boys are the murderers. The five crew members agree not to mention anything until they can think of a solid plan to deal with them. Chris and Stella have a private talk, discussing what will happen once everyone else finds out. Chris tells her that people won't care anymore, but she disagrees. He decides to leave her alone, but she asks him to stay the night. The next morning, Zack knocks on the door and invites them to the cafeteria. He announces to the crew members that he's the new captain of the ship, and the rules they have in place are about to change. He says that they'll need to fight the alien through whatever means possible, but the truth is about to be exposed. Chris gets up and displays the video in the cafeteria monitor. It shows him and the tall boy killing Richard on purpose. Chris tells everyone that there is no alien, their only enemy is Zack, and he's been lying ever since the incident happened. Zack admits to killing the man, but says that he did it to protect the crew members. The alien was inside Richard, and now it's inside somebody else. That's when he goes around the crew, picking them one by one, to see if they've been possessed by the alien. Suddenly, he picks this scared crew member and tells him that he's the alien. All hell breaks loose and the boy runs away while everyone chases him. In the hallway, the kids brutally beat him to death. Okay, a majority of the Voyagers have completely lost their minds. Chris has just shown all of them evidence that Zack is a murderer, and he concocted a ridiculous story about the alien possessing Richard to gain back their favor. He has no evidence to back up his ability to see the alien in other people, but they're believing it because they're all scared for their lives now that Richard is dead. And if Chris and Sela didn't have to rely on them to fly to the new planet, I would say they should put on oxygen tanks and break a window so everyone else would suffocate. However, Chris and Sela need the others to complete the mission because this is a big Ship, and without their help, something could go wrong. Earning back the majority's loyalty again is important, regardless of how stupid they're being. Reasoning with them seems like the most logical solution, but nobody believes reason anymore, so I would have to beat Zack at his own game. Rather than pretending that the alien isn't real, I would play along with Zack's little game, and while he's asleep, I would concoct plans to make it look like he's conspiring with the alien. He's the only one that can see the alien after all, and that's very suspicious, unless there's a reason for why the alien has chosen him as the only person to communicate with. Before this moment, there has been no sign of an alien in the 10 years they've been up in space, and he's also killed the leader of the mission, which is exactly what an alien would want him to do. First, I would paint the walls with mysterious hieroglyphs that look like an ancient alien language and have them lead to Zack's room. I would then leave Zack covered in paint with the remnants of the paintings in his room. By his logic, the alien takes over an individual's body, and if he can't explain the paintings, but all signs point to him being the painter, then the only logical conclusion is that the alien is inside of him. After this, some of the Voyagers might side with me, but others still side with Zack, like the tall kid since their agendas align with one another. But once I poke holes in Zack's logic, there's no way to definitively redeem himself again which makes it impossible for him to use the same alien strategy to incite fear and get them on his side again. He may try to warp the story to his narrative, but the hieroglyphs would create enough doubt that he would never win everyone's loyalty back. Zack gets the crew members ready to fight the aliens by gathering all the tools they have as weapons. Meanwhile, Chris's group decides what to do. They're outpowered and outnumbered, and their chances of survival are looking slimmer by the second. However, Sela asks Chris about the actual weapons room, knowing that Richard told him where it was before he died. Later, Chris finds a small 
small hatch in the hallway and shimmies his way over to the locked door. He inputs a password into the keypad, but it doesn't work. The door begins to beep, attracting the attention of passing members of Zack's group. They wake Zack up and tell him what happened. Meanwhile, Chris finds some tools in another room that will help him force open the door. Walking back to the weapons room, he sees Zack and the others taking apart the walls. Scared, he runs off while they pry open the door. After breaking into the secret armory, they find dozens of weapons boxes inside and take them. Meanwhile, two members from Chris's group walk into Zack's room and ask to switch sides. He agrees, but in return, he asks them where their old group is hiding. Meanwhile, Chris, Sella, and the remaining team member watch them on the monitors in the surveillance room. It's clear they're going to be hunted down, and the boy tells them they only have one option, kill Zack. That's when they notice the group moving rooms, and suddenly they cut the power before heading to the surveillance room. Zack's group forces the door open and rush forward to grab the other crewmates. They drag Chris out and leave the others behind. In the hallway, Sella here asks Zack if they can talk in private, but he tells her to say whatever she wants right now. She insists that she's in love with him and says that she wants to join his group, but Zack declines her request. Chris's remaining crew member comes out and tries to reason with Zack's group, but the tall kid here shoots her by accident. Realizing that she's dead, everyone is shocked. Zack tries shooting Chris, but he and Sella run away in different directions. They quickly meet up in another part of the ship and run into the main quarters, hiding in a hatch. Zack runs in and tells everyone to check the hatches. He shoots the walls in an attempt to kill them, but one of the girls tells him he's destroying the food supplies. Okay, Zack needs to be taken down, and there's no easy way to do it. Chris and Sella are going to need to get their hands dirty, or more people are going to be killed. Any moment now, it could be them too. Zack feels threatened by Chris, and Sella didn't want Zack romantically, so both of their lives are in danger. At this point, the best case scenario is for Sella and Chris to maintain a strong alliance with the members of the Voyagers that only joined Chris's group for their own safety. These people still believe that Zack is a psychopath, but don't want to die, so they have joined his ranks for their own safety. The good thing about having having these people in his group is that they can get close to Zack and also figure out the different social dynamics between the other members of the Voyagers. There's a possibility that some members are starting to question his methods now that he's killed a few people and it will be helpful to plant more seeds of doubt in these members' ears. The two members that have also joined Zack's group could help in putting some of the blue liquid into Zack and the tall kid's food to help sedate them without them knowing. Once they're sedated, they would be easy to reason with and even physically fight. Zack and the tall kid are armed now and it was a terrible misstep for Chris not to get the weapons while he had a chance. He and Sela need to lay low and find a place to hide, while those that they still have alliances with try to kill Zack from the inside. Killing Zack is more important because once he's dead, it will be much easier to dispel all of the lies he came up with while he was alive and help the other members of the group see reason again. If I were Chris or Sela, I would look for anything in the garden that could hopefully poison Zack and take him out in a clean, easy way that he will never see coming. Zack is egotistical and believes in physical force, so trying to kill him in a method that doesn't require us to directly confront him is the best case scenario. A physical confrontation to kill Zack is inevitable, but to make their lives easier, getting more people on their side or killing Zack inconspicuously will help them now that he's armed with intergalactic guns. They manage to avoid being found and climb out of the hatch leading to the hallway. They run into another room while shots are fired into the door. Chris finds a gas container in one of the drawers and hides from the shooter. Suddenly, the tall kid walks in and Chris here smacks him while Sela stabs him in the neck. They walk out to the hallway and are ambushed by Zack, who shoots the gun out of Chris's hand. Running away, they head over to the airlock while locking the doors behind them. Chris suggests they get into a spacesuit and head outside the ship. With no other option, he throws tinfoil over the door window and they get dressed. Zack finds the door and shoots it open, but this was his biggest mistake. The airlock is opened and he's about to get sucked out to space. That's when he grabs Sela and tries to take her with him. He inputs the closing code while holding on for his life. Suddenly, he grabs a knife from his leg and tries to stab her spacesuit. Chris jumps on him, but Zack manages to push him off and he flies out of the ship. Trying to get back inside, Sela kicks him out of the ship, killing him instantly. She looks outside to find Chris and manages to spot a glimpse of him holding on to the ship. Back inside, Chris finds the rest of the crew and tells them to stand down. Their nightmare is over and they promise to never let this happen again. The couple watch one final video on Richard who says the mission will be a success as long as they keep pushing forward. Another election is held and this time, Sela is appointed as the captain. She vows to keep everything democratic and decides that everyone stop taking the blue. Years later, Chris and Sela end up having a baby, and the rest of the crew soon follows. Eventually, the crew grows older, and the next generations take over. 86 years after takeoff, the voyage is finally complete. The families look on as they reach the new planet, while the rest of Earth is probably dead by now. But what do you think? How would you beat Voyagers? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching. Leave a like and subscribe. Check out the How to Beat playlist for more videos like this. And don't forget that from now on, we'll be uploading on Wednesdays and Saturdays. Until next time.
Have a damn good day.